Good? Okay. Howdy, y'all. My name is Trenton Brendel, and today I will be teaching you about astronomy at the Large Binocular Telescope Observatory. Um, the Large Binocular Telescope uh, is one of the largest telescopes in the world. Um, and as indicated by the name, it is a binocular telescope. You can see I have some binoculars in my hands right now. Um, these are handheld binoculars. This telescope is most certainly not handheld. The lenses on the front of these are about two inches across each one. The mirrors that are in this observatory are about the size of a, a mid-sized school bus across. And you can see um, in this next figure here as well that I've drawn a stick figure for scale. Um, they're really, really big mirrors. I'm going to return to this slide for a moment because I want to emphasize the, the reason why these mirrors are so big is because each mirror in and of itself can collect a very, very large amount of light. Um, 8.4 meter primary mirrors um, collect so much light that they are very enticing for astronomers to use these telescopes because they can look at really, really faint objects that are far away. Um, so. Yeah, I also mentioned this is a binocular telescope. You can see um, in this configuration where the telescope is pointed straight up at the sky, it's called Zenith, pointed straight up, um, that we have um, two cameras sitting above the primary mirrors. And I'll mention a little bit about these later as well. Um, but there's uh, different modes of operation for the observatory um, and the flexibility of having this, uh, what's called cantilever design, where you have two sides to a single observatory one with each mirror, means that you can do different kinds of operations or different kinds of observations at the exact same time. You can actually see in this image that we have a blue side to the telescope. It has a blue camera overhead. It has blue strips on the side that observes more in the blue end of the visible spectrum. Um, and then on the other side, we have a red camera that observes more in the red end of the visible spectrum. These cameras actually have different types of optical glass inside of them and different optical characteristics that allow them to observe in different bands at the same time, um, giving observers a lot of flexibility when they're doing operations. Um, and it's not only these cameras, this is a very early commissioning um, image from early on back in the early 2000s when the observatory first went on sky. Um, since then, there's been a lot more instruments added on um, and there are many more imaging modes that we'll discuss here in the end. But I brought up first the primary mirrors. And so that is what we're gonna, what we're gonna talk about first is uh, these amazing 8.4 meter primary mirrors. You can see here's an image with a human for scale in the central hole. Um, I don't know the name of this human, but I'm sure he's, he's famous for what he has done here. Um, but these are really big mirrors and they're made right here um, on the University of Arizona's campus at the Richard F. Karras Mirror Lab. Um, and here actually you can see a, a CAD model or computer-aided design model of one of these honeycomb mirrors um, that I've made transparent so you can see inside of the mirror, not just the top surface, but you can see through it. And if you look at the face sheet or the front of the mirror, you can see these honeycomb shells inside of it. Um, and these honeycomb shells are actually holes inside the mirror in the shape of a honeycomb um, that fill the entire mirror. There's over 1,170, I think there's almost exactly 1,173 of these cells inside of a given 8.4 meter mirror um, for the LBT and these are used for light weighting. If you were to make one of these 8.4 meter mirrors solid or monolithic, one sheet of glass, it would be so heavy that you couldn't move it. You wouldn't be able to move it, you wouldn't be able to bend it, it wouldn't be able to adjust its temperature on short enough time scales to keep up with the changing atmosphere at night, which is very important because when the atmosphere changes and it gets colder during the night and warmer um, at times and you get wind moving through an observatory, uh, things change fast and that can cause your optical system or your telescope to perform very poorly. Part of the research I do actually helps to control for that um, using something called active optics, but we're not going to go into that today. Um, but these honeycomb mirrors, um, they were originally conceived by a man named Roger Angel, who is a genius, um, and he came up with this concept of uh, spin casting which we'll demonstrate in a demo here today, but you can see these ceramic honeycomb cores are being loaded inside of a, a furnace. Um, glass is being loaded on top of those honeycomb cores, and then you put the top down and the whole thing spins around as it's heated up. And when you do that, you get 
a curved mirror shape. And it turns out this curve is actually what's called a parabola. If you've taken any sort of algebra course, you may know what a parabola is. We'll talk more about it here in a moment. Um, here's some more pretty figures of, of glass being loaded on top of the uh, ceramic cores, the furnace being lowered, furnace top being lowered onto the furnace with the glass fully loaded, um, and then the rotating furnace that rotates about, I think it's 7.6 times every minute once it reaches its max temperature of around 1200 degrees Celsius. Um, the glass starts melting in the furnace, as you can see happening here from a camera pointed into the furnace at around 900 degrees Celsius. Um, and then once it melts, you can see there's these like sparkly little bits showing up here. And that's actually air bubbles that are coming up from the glass and boiling off the surface. You don't want to have any air inside of your mirror because it can cause um, breakage down the road. It's essentially like having um, a hole inside of your bridge. And if you bang on that part of the bridge really hard, the bridge is going to collapse. Same thing with a mirror. Um, if you have a hole, which is an inclusion or a glass bubble inside, it can cause the mirror to break um, and other undesirable characteristics. Here's a closer view. You can actually see the, uh, the markings on the side of the furnace where it started around five, six inches of glass, glass chunks. It's called O'Hara E6 borosilicate glass. Um, it's a low CTE, low expansion glass from Japan um, that shows up in these chunks that you saw and then ends up into this uh, liquid form inside of the furnace. Um, and then by the end of the casting process inside of the spin casting furnace, you end up with about two inches of glass on the top of those ceramic cores. Um, so I'm going to show you a spin casting demonstration of uh, what that actually looks like. So as you can see here, I have a turntable right here. And then I have um, a bowl with water inside of it balanced on top of a uh, a, a sacrificial uh, roll of tape. Um, and you can see if I start rotating that turntable and increase the speed, you can see curvature on the what's called the meniscus of the water, um, which is essentially just where the water um, hits the bottom. And you can see at the edges, it's curling up, but it's not curling up like you would see with a sphere. And there, there is a reason for that. The physics behind this dictates that you actually get a parabola instead of a sphere. You can see if I go back to this equation, when you spin a liquid around inside of a cylinder, you form a parabola, this y equals x squared equation. I just realized I forgot my laser pointer. y equals x squared right here, which is what we see illustrated right here as well, is a parabolic curve or a, a parabola of revolution, also called a paraboloid if you've taken any calculus in your high school coursework. Um, but this is a demonstration of the reason why you want to have a spin casting furnace where you can spin the thing around. You have to remove way less glass when you already have a parabola, which is the desired shape for these on axis primary mirrors because they form a perfect point of light that's focused to a perfect spot on axis. Um, and if you don't have to hog out all of that glass in the middle, one, you're saving money and two, you're saving a whole lot of time because that's a lot of glass that you have to take out. So Roger Angel really, truly is a genius for coming up with this, uh, this method of spin casting that enables this kind of mirror making. Nobody else can make mirrors this big because this is such a unique um, ability that we have that is not found anywhere else in the world. So uh, here is a view of a finished honeycomb mirror blank for the large binocular telescope. This is actually the first blank that was finished. And I say blank because even though it looks like it's nice and shiny on the top surface, that's nowhere near the optical finish that needs to be achieved for actual observing. Now, when we think about things in the optical range, um, we have to make sure that our surface figure, which is the shape, general shape of the mirror, and our surface finish, which is essentially the roughness of the mirror, are very, very good, meaning very low deviation of the intended surface figure to what you actually have on the mirror and very low roughness across the mirror. And we have specifications that we define um, depending on how uh, good the mirror has to be for the observing application. Um, and you can see in the, this image here, um, Buddy Martin, who is the lead project scientist for the, the mirror lab, looking at the polishing tool that's being used. This is actually something called a rigid conformal lap, which is a, a tool that my advisor came up with, which uses silly putty um, which is hard on short time scales and soft on long time scales to polish out imperfections in the mirror. 
without imparting uh, too much uh, imperfection on a local um, level. And so when we first start with uh, the process of going from a mirror blank to a finished mirror, we use uh, diamond tools and we do something called grinding, um, which does very coarse removal. We're removing many microns. Uh, you can think of that as like fractions of an inch, small fractions of an inch um, in a short time span because we want to remove a lot. And then uh, we go to fine grinding, which is a little bit finer um, grit that we're using. And then finally, we move on to polishing and surface finish. Um, and that's when we're getting down to this, this rigid conformal lap that you see here using um, something called ferrous oxide, which is, um, a, or, or cerium, I think it's also called cerium, um, which is used to finish these mirrors. And it's essentially an abrasive slurry that's put on top of the mirror with really, really tiny particles um, to get fine removal and finish the last little bits on the mirror. Uh, we can also use uh, things called a stress lap. Um, this is used to great effect with um, the monolithic primary tertiary mirror for the large uh, synoptic survey or the Vera Rubin Observatory uh, telescope, which has two mirrors in one. Um, and with this stress lap, you can actually bend the shape of the tool as you're doing your polishing. And you can see these pitch pads shown on the bottom of the tool. Um, which pitch is basically just like tar. It's used to polish optical surfaces. Um, but by doing this, you get much more control over the local deformations on the surface, which can be really beneficial. Um, and then finally, once you've got a finished uh, polished mirror, you have to illuminize it to reflect light off of it. And so at the Large Binocular Telescope, the illuminizing is actually done at the observatory with something called a bell jar. And you can see this bell jar here. This is 8.4 meters plus across. It's actually about 10 meters across. Um, and it clamps down on top of the mirror, on, on the mirror cell, on the observatory. They actually bring the bell jar to the mirror, put it on, and then illuminize the thing. They rip the old illuminized coating off and illuminize again. And this happens every other year, because in the interim years, they will uh, clean the mirror. So they, they flip sides. One side gets illuminized, one side gets clean and then you flip every other year. And so that is the idea of illuminizing uh, a mirror. Once you've got that mirror and you've got a beautiful, uh, in this case, Gregorian telescope, um, you can use it to do science. And there's three main modes the LBT uses to do science. There's what's called prime focus, where it uses only one mirror, just the primary mirror. So this first path going from collimated light out at the stars, um, focusing off the par parabolic mirror that we just showed how it's made a moment ago, uh, to a prime focus up here, which is where the prime focus cameras come in that I mentioned earlier briefly. Uh, we also have Gregorian mode where we use um, something called an adaptive secondary mirror, which I'll mention briefly in a moment, um, and focus light down behind the primary mirror. Um, so imagine this, this fold mirror is not here. Um, and then we have bent Gregorian mode, which is really one of the key strengths of having two mirrors side by side is that you can bend that light from the, the Gregorian focus down to um, a focal plane that is able to be co-located with the focal plane of the other mirror. So you have two, two big primary mirrors in bent Gregorian mode taking light in together. And at the end of the presentation, I'll show what that looks like. But here are some of the swing arms used at LBT. Um, the large binocular camera, uh, the swing arms are just trusses. They're just mechanical trusses, these black trusses. Um, that move optics in and out of the optical path. The, these optics, the camera, the uh, secondary mirror, and the tertiary mirror. And you can see in this very busy image, more modern image, this is actually what LBT looks like these days, um, the large binocular camera right here. It's currently swung out of the beam path. The adaptive secondary, which is swung into the beam path right here. It's a concave mirror. Um, and it actually has an area in the middle that's not used because we have an obscuration and there's a hole in the center of the primary for light to come through. Um, so we don't use the entire surface, but we use most of the surface. And then we have the tilted tertiary fold mirror down here for bent Gregorian mode, which can be rotated to get three different um, instrument bays light. So there's, uh, I forget what each one is, but I know uh, Lucy is one of them that's used for infrared imaging and spectroscopy, just looking at uh, wavelengths of light spread out. Um, we have the, the mode in the middle where we can do a lot of different fiber fed methods where we feed light into an optical fiber and then we can combine it with light from the other side. And this is how we get something called large binocular telescope interferometer or LBTI, 
where we take two sides, combine the light and fibers, and then interfere them, and you can get interference fringes, which I won't go into because it's a little advanced for, for this, but it's worth knowing about because it's very cool. Um, and then some other instruments in the back that I can't remember right now. Um, here's actually a, a brief optical uh, prescription of what or a layout of what the prime focus looks like. You have that primary mirror, and I mentioned that a, par a parabola only forms a perfect focus on axis. As soon as you like look a little bit off axis, so stars that are not quite in the middle of your field, the image quality drops off pretty substantially. And so you have to use um, this corrective optic. We call it um, a field corrector, which is in front of the binocular camera. And there's a, a set of four um, detector chips that are behind it. It goes one, two, three, and then a fourth one on its side. Um, but in front of that, we have, I think it's seven lenses. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six lenses plus a filter wheel. Um, one of the lenses is actually a filter window. So it does count even though it's just planar. Um, and we use that to get um, really beautiful images, which I'll show here at the end. Um, the Gregorian mode I mentioned has that adaptive secondary. Um, so you can see the light comes to a perfect focus on axis right here, and then hits that adaptive secondary mirror with a hole in the middle, um, which is a wiggly mirror. So it shakes around, and using a system called adaptive optics, you can correct for um, optical aberrations or wiggliness in the atmosphere. Um, and then it focuses that light down behind the primary um, onto the Gregorian focus to do um, imaging or spectroscopy with a system called the multi um, multi-object double spectroscope, uh, double spectrometer mods for short. Uh, and then we have the bent, bent Gregorian mode where we insert a tertiary mirror and we can fold that light to one of three instrument ports. Um, as I mentioned earlier with these binoculars right here, this is a binocular observatory. So you can combine that light to get uh, a, a combined baseline, interferometric baseline of about 22 meters across. Um, which is huge. That's like having a 22 meter mirror and being able to measure um, characteristics of the light coming in uh, with interferometry, which is, I'm not gonna go into because it's not relevant here necessarily, but basically think of it as you have light here and you have light there and you put them together and you get wigglies. Um, and the LBT can make pretty pictures. Some of these are taken uh, with a large binocular camera. Um, this is actually a commissioning image from uh, first light of NGC 891. Um, some more images, Messier 1 or the Crab Nebula. Uh, Messier 101, the Pinwheel Galaxy taken with LBC. Um, and then uh, the Ring Nebula. And then you can actually see down here, they're tiny images, I'm sorry, but um, there's some, some wiggly lines here. Uh, they're called fringes. And these were taken with LBTI, or both sides operating at once, combining the light and interfering them. Um, which is one of the most exciting capabilities that LBT has to offer as a binocular observatory. Um, and this is an example of the adaptive optic system doing what's called closing the loop, where you can correct for the atmospheric aberrations and get a beautiful diffraction limited airy disk. So that's the, these concentric rings, um, which is basically just saying your optics are effectively perfect. Um, and here's a view of the Milky Way over Mount Graham. Thank you for listening to my presentation and uh, bear down.